This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 27, Episode 5. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Well, good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out Happy there. Happy Father's and, uh, Day, everybody. I guess, you know, n- non-dads, too. Sure. Why not? I have dogs. That counts, right? Absolutely, it counts. <laughs> guess what, Matt? <laughs> what? Big show. Big, Big show. show today. Why don't I tell folks what we got coming up? What we got coming up? So today, we're going to take this ordinary-looking Raspberry Pi right here, and we're going to convert it into a Linux-powered battery, Ooh. battery-powered, too. Ooh. Not just Linux-powered, but battery-powered Portable oh. network anonymizer. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, we that's got a awesome. we got a really cool way to make this and in, into a, uh, something you could take around with you, or something you could just leave yeah. at your house. And whenever you want to use the Tor network, it's just available, and you just configure your system to run through it oh, via multiple cool. different methods, and it just does the anonymizing for you. And then when you're done, you just set your system back to normal settings, and you're I back like on the regular that. internet. It's nice a, little out of the box experience. It's there. really cool. So we're going to go through that. Plus, in the slash Etsy segment. We're going to give you an overview of how to roll your own jungle disk type backup solution. I, you know, uh, that's cool. Ever since we did the switch to Arch, I was like, well, I really like it, but I'm worried that something might break because I have all these GNOME extensions. Sure. I'm not even so much worried about Arch breaking, I'm worried about GNOME breaking. Right, right, exactly, the desktop. Yeah, so I want to just be able to back up my system, and then if I do a big update and something breaks, I want to be able to roll back. Makes it easy. And then I figure that kind of gives me my insurance policy, but lets me stay cutting edge. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So uh, I wanted to do something similar to jungle disk, but I have issues with jungle disk, so I just decided to roll my own. I love that idea. So we'll cover that. And we've got some awesome feedback, the news as well. But first, Matt, yes. it's our picks. Woo-hoo. All right, so why don't we start with the Runs Linux? This is an awesome oh, one. It came cool. in from James McRae. Oh, right on. And he says, hi, Laz. I sent in an email a couple of weeks ago about a project I was working on, but as they indicated in the show, that was futile. <laughs> the best way to reach them was the subreddit, so here goes. The project is called Firebox. It's a 3D internet browser which runs on Linux and is meant for the Oculus Rift. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, the Oculus Rift is that virtual reality headset. Right. Um, and then he uh, includes a link here, and check this out. So, uh, if you're well, watching the video it version... it really brings the couples together. I mean, that's yeah. awesome, right? If you're watching the video version, there's kind of a goofy picture of a couple wearing this. But then you get to see what they see. And this whole demo, you might notice, is running on top of Ubuntu. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it uses OpenGL and Qt5 and the Oculus SDK, which runs on top of Linux. Nice. And what's interesting is they con- they've they kind of converted web pages into rooms. Now, that's an interesting concept. I, I can only imagine what my bookmarks would look like. Hmm. Okay. Matt, what are you saying? What are you- <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not like all. No, 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 no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, See, look uh, at this now. Now, do you remember, <laughs> well, do you remember like back, I don't remember which, uh, which walled garden it was, but it was like Prodigy or CompuServe. They did something kind of like this. And look, here's the overview of like, you can you now can you imagine web designers are doing like room layouts instead oh of web page layouts? And then and then the people who are visiting the website travel down these corridors and then you enter the room you want to go to for the web page that you want to. You know, this might finally be the push we need to bring tables back. <laughs> tables in a room. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant. Oh, okay. Come on, that was fun. Gotcha, gotcha. That was pathetic. So, uh, I don't know. I... I, I can't I can't remember which service that was, but uh, I, think, I want to say CompuServe. It I might mean, have been. It, it feels like a CompuServe move over AOL. AOL wouldn't have tried something so ballsy. So yeah. And here's another concept where it's more of a wall and things like that. So there's a few different things it looks like, but pretty neat. And it's yeah. cool that this cutting edge virtual reality stuff run on top of Linux. That's so awesome. Yeah. And I'm is. kind of a fan for the whole wall experience. The rooms might be a little overwhelming. Well, back in the CompuServe days, you know, if you think about it, that was done over dial up. Yeah, and wow. probably a three eighty six or a four eighty six. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> that's going back. Holy yeah, cow. it was a plug in, Mr. Mango says for mm. uh, for one of those services. Now, if you want to uh, join us, uh, oh yeah, there was also that sort of a thing appeared for just for the general web in two thousand one, Mr. Mango says. Oh wow, uh, you can join us live over jblive.tv Sundays at ten a.m. Mm-hmm. Pacific, which, by the way, would be what? What is that? One Eastern over jblive.tv and uh, jblive.info for the audio. And uh, nice. yeah, she did just one Eastern. And uh, 5 p.m. GMT, I think. Yeah. And uh, right. we'd love to have you join us live and hang out in our chat room. And then we have also lots of in between segment stuff oh, where yeah. we hang out and do stuff. Like this morning, I was playing a little Star Trek online. I got it running under crossover on my Arch mm-hmm. install. And I uh, was doing Some a little demo. Interesting insights during the experience and whatnot. Yeah, I'm having a little trouble with uh, my ground combat being a little choppy, but 
I won't trouble you guys with my problems. All right, Matt. Well, before we go on to uh, our further picks, I want to thank this week's sponsor, GoDaddy.com. Woo! GoDaddy.com, longtime sponsors of the Linux Action Show. Now, we've got a great code. Right. It's Linux249 when you check out. Linux249 gets you a .com for $2.00. And forty nine cents, two dollars and forty nine cents, or a transfer for two dollars and forty nine cents. Then additional dot coms are just nine ninety nine. After that, now don't forget, maybe you've got uh, something else you want to get, Matt. Maybe you've yes. got like a million dot coms. I have a ton. I wouldn't doubt it. I probably do have a million. Yeah, and maybe I, I want to bring them to go down. Maybe so. You use know? the Linux two forty nine to transfer those over, Matt, because yeah. you can get a good deal when you transfer. And heck. Let's say maybe you want to get some hosting because once you get all those dot coms over, you got to put them somewhere. That's right. You got to point them at something. So you want to get some hosting. Maybe you want to get an SSL cert. Maybe you're working on something like a project with a group of people. Just group it all up in there. And use get it the, done. Here, here's the great thing we got a code where you can get 35% off your entire order. Just use the code 35 off two when you check oh, out 35 off two for 35% off your order over at thegodaddy.com. Nice buy. You know, it's awesome. And as not only have they, not only is GoDaddy great because they've been long time supporters of our of our work which is awesome yep. and they're big supporters of the apache project but they've also been just great for me in my professional career because yeah. i as as a contractor when i walk into a place and their domains are all oh, settled yes. with godaddy it, it it makes my life so much easier it makes the transition process so much simpler especially when like it's an aggrieved it guy who's left right and so like you can't really get a hold of him anymore <laughs> yeah, he doesn't care he like doesn't if care. they've registered at some hole in the wall domain name right. registrar it is it is so stressful to get that taken care of. And you know, and the benefit about GoDaddy is they're kind of the industry standard because they're right. the world's number one domain name registrar. So in my personal life in my and in my business life, I have been a huge fan of GoDaddy.com. Thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Sweet. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Okay, Matt. So I, I got to get into a pick this week that was sent in. So the Oculus Rift yes. uh, browser was submitted by uh, James uh, McRae. Still cool. Very, Very cool. The next... Our pick, the Android pick this week, mm. was also uh, sent in uh, by uh, Vior Enrico. Oh, I okay. think I think that's how I say it, right? I think I'm supposed to say it like that. I like the tongue roll. And it's uh, OSM and Ooh, hey. and he writes as follows: Hi, Matt and Chris. I have a suggestion for the Android pick on Lass. Seven months ago, I moved from Italy, my home country, to Ireland. I bought a Nexus Seven to help my new life, and as you know, it has GPS. Nice. So I searched for maps and a GPS application, possibly free software, and using OpenStreetMap data, which we've talked a little bit oh, about the show cool. before. All right. Uh, and he said, I found OSM AND, and he links me to it. He says, it's a brilliant application. It has offline map support, oh, but it. you can still have an overlay from online sources. Mm -hmm. It can route you while driving, doing a very good job. I used it to uh, for a weekend to travel from Austria, and it worked just fine. Wow. Check it out, and keep in mind, for an app pick, love the shows. I have the Firefox extension installed. Well, thank you, sir. That's awesome. Uh, so here it is, Matt. It is called uh, OSM AND, and the reason why I'm calling it uh, OSM AND is because... It stands. It stands for Open Street Maps and Navigational Data, or something like oh, that. Oh, okay. And it's it's totally free in the uh, Android App Store, and I've got a little demo of it right here, oh, right as a on. matter of fact. Check this out. Yeah. And I got to tell you, as much awesome traveling as he's doing, I mean, which I'm incredibly jealous of, by the way. I know, right? Uh, that's a. I mean, that's clearly an awesome app to have. So, uh, so it it is free, and you right. can and you for for free. Although you can upgrade to like a plus version, but for free you get. Uh, you get to download 10 maps and voice oh, packs and stuff like that. So it'll do text-to-speech, and I've downloaded North America, Washington. Right. It's about a 75-megabyte download, so you're going to want to kind of be aware of that when you do okay. the download. Here, you know what? I have a little camera right here. All I right. could show it off. Cool. That'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we go. I'll, let, me turn up, let me turn on this camera so you guys can see this. Uh, it's pretty slick, and it, it, I don't know, the map's quality are maybe not as, quali as quality as, say, maybe Google Maps. Right, but they're, but they're not bad. But because they're open street maps, one of the things that's cool about them is you can, uh, you can edit them and update them in real time, which is super slick. I love You the can say, oh, aspect. this is wrong, I need yes. to fix this. So there's tons of features, features, including what I like a lot is the offline functionality, so that way if you're going somewhere where you don't have connectivity, mm -hmm. and combine that with the fact that you can make your own notes on there is really great. And then they have a series of plugins. Some of them are free, some of them are pay. You can do things like uh, improve the map coloring or uh, different voice packs, uh, uh, and the oh, plugin nice. prices range from free to, like, Five bucks. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Pretty reasonable. Yeah. yeah. The UI is okay. It's not great. Right. I mean, remember, this is all open source. Everything's free. So it's 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 pretty good for, for what you pay for it. And if you're, nice. uh, you're not happy with the Google Maps uh, built-in app or if it just uh, isn't available in your area or whatever it might right. be, you can check it out. And you see they feature a lot on all kinds of places all around the world. They've got oh, tons of voice cool. packs in different languages. 
Uh, so yeah, just and, make sure. And Antarctica. Now that's I would not have expected that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, just make sure that when you uh, set it up for the first time, you're on Wi-Fi because those first yes. map packs can be like 70, 70 megabytes Ooh, or so. Yes. So uh, very cool. So uh, thank you to uh, Rico for sending that in yeah. for, and that's O S M A N D free, and we'll have a link in the show notes. Loving it. All right, now it's time for the desktop pick. Both of these were se- actually no, the first one was sent in, the second one I kind of found on my own. But Matt, cool. Cool. Yes. when we made the switch to Arch, one of the things people had oh, told yeah. us a ton about is you got to check out ZSH over and over and over and over. Yeah, I don't even know why because like ZSH yeah. works on all distros. You think? Uh, but uh, so uh, Saint Ford. The Word wrote in, since Chris and Matt made the switch to Arch Linux, I'd like to suggest both of them try out ZSH. I guess Alan calls it Z-Shell. I yeah. found auto-completion feature very handy and saves me a lot of time. Other features are like uh, other features I really like is the uh, wildcard path. I still rely on Bash for my scripting, but only because I had t- no time to get deep with ZSH scripting language yet. So it has its own scripting language, too. So far, I have not tried other shells, but being Bash is the default in most Linux. Sure distros and zsh is topping it i simply say it's the best i know of and then of course tons nice. of people in the comments jumped in and said oh yeah oh yeah it's great well, lots it's of great. confirmation there we have definitely to i installed it i play a little bit the autocomplete is really cool right. another one that i started playing with uh this week is called fish shell fish shell. Uh, th- another that. tagline is finally a command line shell for the 90s <laughs> i like it i like it a little uh, retro. fish yeah. is a smart user-friendly command line shell for os 10 linux and the rest of the family it's got auto suggestions sane scripting as well mm-hmm. uh glorious vga colors and a web-based configuration which is kind of oh i would totally i totally use that That's so cool. i installed fish shell and it's available okay. in the arch repo um I mean, I'll just, maybe i just launch it via terminal yeah there you go and uh it's uh, it is kind of neat. It's got it's, you can kind of see like uh, so if I run fish shell. Kinda. I thought I installed fish shell. Maybe I maybe I installed it on my other computer. Could be. Oh, it's just fish. It's just, oh, it's fish, just fish. fish. Okay. Oh, yeah. well, that's easy enough. So you see how it started to auto complete oh, my wow. help command there. Oh, wow. And then when you type when you type help, it actually brings up a web based. Oh, that's uh, kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's high tech. It's uh, and their their auto complete oh. feature is really cool. Um, so both fish and oh. zsh kind of spice up the standard plain old command line that's been around uh, forever. Into something a little more smart, spicy. Yeah, I like it. I do too. Thanks to the subreddit for uh, we got bo- we got both those picks from the subreddit this week. I, well, fish, I found myself, but ZSH and uh, the Maps application, and they're both free because that's how it. we roll, right? That's how we roll. All right, Matt. All right, let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. Yes. I wanted to share a little story because, you know, I recently got a new phone, and I switched my wife over to the Galaxy Note 2, and she's taking the Android Challenge, which we're covering in the faux show if you haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, this is actually my third Ting phone, I realized. First, I brought my uh, Evo device over to Ting, my Evo 4G, just to kind of see if I liked the service. And once I determined I was happy, I upgraded to the Note 2. And I remarked at that time how simple it was to just go on there and within 10 minutes, or not even that, not even 10 minutes, I had my phone activated and everything was ready to go. I thought that was fantastic. Well, I got to tell you, Matt, uh, the, uh, the buying experience was even easier this time around. Now, you know, no having just throwing my wife on there, it's $6 flat. I don't have to have like a whole another plan with a whole right. another set of minutes that we're not even using because, you know, maybe we use another 100 minutes with another Avoid phone Avoid that online. whole other hassle. Yeah, it's, 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 it's so much more streamlined. It's, it's just how it should be, and it's a more direct relationship between me and Ting. I absolutely oh, I love it. Ting.com. Go over there and check them out. Go to last.ting.com. Mm-hmm. You save $25. And, you know, just recently, just to see how it went, I went ahead and went over on my data usage. Just to kind of be a guinea pig, right. it is so smooth. If you go over, it's no big deal. You only pay for what you use. No overcharges or penalties. If you use more than you thought you would, you just boom. They just bump you up. You just pay. Just pay for what you use. No big deal. And if you don't use what you thought you would, Ting will credit you on your own used service. If you use less than you thought, boom, they're gonna hit you up. They're gonna hit you with that, which is fantastic. And That's then, cool. you know, when you've got when you got like. Uh, when you're at a situation where you're at a restaurant and it's going uh, super slow, right? Been there. Been there. My son, my son loves these uh, Angry Bird tunes that are in the Angry Birds app. Oh, okay. And he's got it on the iPad. It's so awesome because you have free hotspotting and tethering on every Ting device. It just comes included with the service, along with voicemail and so all you've that. You've got internet anywhere. You Everything. Go. Yeah. So you just turn it on. Boom! We got hotspots. They About can jump it. on the internet if they want to, or they can play right on the device itself. Keeps the kids happy. Allows the food a chance to come. It's yeah. totally how it should be. It's Absolutely. totally how it should be. Ting just makes life easy. You don't have to worry about those kinds of things. And the savings is. Absolutely fantastic. Go to last.ting.com, and then while you're over there, hit that savings calculator. That savings calculator is really going to show you what I'm talking about. You sit down with your bill, and you put you plug in the different information, and then you'll see why you want to switch to Ting. And that's nice. just at the price, and then it's all the great features from there. So thanks to Ting.com for sponsoring this week's episode of 
the Linux Action Show. Woo! All right, All right, Matt. Our first story. All right. It's Microsoft. Uh oh. No. We're pretty sparingly about our Microsoft stories on we the try. Linux Action Show. We so we don't often lead with a Microsoft news story. But this week, I thought it was one to discuss. Microsoft has been said to give zero-day exploits to the U.S. government before it patches them. Bloomberg came out with quite a bombshell last night discussing how tech companies apparently work with the NSA and other government agencies not to pass data not to pass not to pass data on users over to the government, but to share exploit information. Sometimes before it's public or even patched. Now, there's a lot of different reasons they could do this, right? They could do it so that way the NSA could protect against flaws. Yeah. Although I don't think that's their real reason, but okay. Oh, what yeah, do you I'm think? Saying, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, it's plausible. I mean, that 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 could be the reason, but it just it's it's really highly suspect. The fact that that's I don't know. I mean, what's the benefit? I'm not really. Yeah, I mean, it's know. definitely it's definitely great for cyber espionage, and you know, you look at yeah. uh, so Stuxnet took advantage of seven zero day exploits in Windows. So I believe that the number was seven zero day non patched non disclosed exploits. Mm. So you do wonder where they got that information, yeah, right? Exactly. It's kind of like, wait a minute here. And also, uh, since Microsoft has a set patching schedule, if you got the exploit one month ahead of time, you'd have right. a month window. Exactly. So you have a nice little window to work with if you want to. Uh, I don't know, take a little snoop through the PC. I think you know, in retrospect, this probably doesn't concern a lot of U.S. Consumers, and I'm thinking Probably of Windows not. on the desktop in like high security institutions. I'm thinking of Windows Server. U.S. companies maybe not so worried, but companies outside the United States, exactly. They're, you know, I'm wondering if this is going to take Windows off the list for some of these folks. I would think so because I mean, you figure this information is then leaked to a private contractor, for instance, that maybe wants to utilize that exploit for corporate espionage, uh, which is not unheard of. Yeah. That could be a problem. Yeah. That and, can totally be a problem. And as a government, like say like take the Chinese government, you have right. to you have to figure they kinda have to worry about relying on this stuff when they know that a potentially hostile government has back doors into their infrastructure. Exactly. And that's totally going to make them want to back off of us, clearly, right? I mean, they're going to be totally all about that. So, yeah. unfortunately, not so much. All right. So, yes. uh, moving on to the next story. And by the way, uh, good coverage for that Microsoft story if you want to read more about it, because I think it will have some long term ramifications. Mm -hmm. A good article over at TechDirt and a good article over at Ars Technica, both of which went into a lot of details, including the fact that um, uh, I, I was reported on years ago that Gates went into a. a um, Windows source code sharing agreement with the Chinese government years ago, back when oh, Gates wow. was running things. So maybe they've already got access to it's it. It's possible. Too. Yeah. It's possible. Uh oh, Matt. Oh, I know. My Another reason. mirror story uh, for you. Mirrors uh, causing problems and concerns for the Ubuntu uh, derivatives. Now we all know that Canonical's planning on switching over to their own in house display server in the next year rather than using like Xorg or Wayland. And that's great for Ubuntu, but that's not helping me with the derivatives like I need. No, no. In fact, uh, according to uh, Pharonix here. Uh, uh, KDE is not going to support Mir, as we've talked about. And so now you have things like Kubuntu. They're starting to have a technical discussions about uh, what they're going to do. And uh, basically, Kubuntu is either going to have to use Mir or oh, use Wayland and hope everything just works out. Now, I, I think this is a little reactionary at this point because it's not like Xorg is going away. That's true. But I think they're trying to plan ahead. And I, and I you know, I applaud them for that. Yeah. Definitely got to work, start working these things in now. And I, I, if I was gonna, if I was gonna put money on it, I right. would say the way the situation plays out long term is, you've got, uh, you've got people that are are gonna be running some of these derivatives on these different experimental mm -hmm. branches, but the ones that are end up shipping to users will be Xorg based for a while. I would think so. I, I mean, just from a stability point of view, knowing where things are gonna land, how yeah. that's gonna work out, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So. All right. Well, this is exciting for us, although I yeah. haven't gotten my hands on it just yet. Uh, the Ardour cool. project announced a three point two, a new version. Now Ardour is that massive workstation yeah. audio editing. A DA, a DA, digital audio workstation application. Wow. Uh, but now, Adore 3.2 has announced video support. I, you know, because I haven't tried this yet, I'm not sure how I feel yet. I, it sounds exciting, but then I kind of think, you, you gotta wonder, but it's right? an audio thing, so right. why do I, I don't know. Yeah, although, um, there could be some benefit there. Uh, Sony Vegas, people love Sony Vegas on mm -hmm. Windows, and that started as an audio editor. Okay, so, well, there's your parallel. Yeah. All right. Um, our Durs, uh, developer says that uh, they've been working on this for a couple of years. Video support allows users of the digital audio workstation software to extract, edit, and mix audio tracks associated with video while still being able to see the video in a preview. Oh, that? Okay. So uh, there's, uh, there's other pro products out there that are still primarily sound editors, but right. they have some video functions so that way you can do sound events in key with the video. Oh, that's nice. So it's still primarily a sound editor but you can load your video in there. And now, that's cool, when, and I've done this with a few folks, to where I suggest that they get pro-level audio 
in its own compartmental, you know, just on its own, and then to do the video separate, quit worrying about trying to connect them, connect them later, sync yeah. them up. This would make that a That's lot you, easier. Then you would do that. This would be sort of like right. that. Once you've once you've pr uh, primarily edited things in your primary video yeah. editor, you've got your sound put together, then you kind of bring them together in this program. This would have made what I did, I did some work uh, for some stand-up comedians in uh, California at one point, and this would have made this so much easier because I, where I was trying to do it, I was trying to do it through, like through Audacity and <laughs> other stuff. And I mean, it, it, I did it and it was fine, but it was just, it was more uh, convoluted than it needed to be because I couldn't really edit anything until I got the entire audio and the entire video put together and yeah I, I like it I, I love the idea good on them huh yeah I'm good on them I think I'm gonna I'm gonna check this out all right so cool. I uh, I have uh, let's see here do we have audio on this let me check my audio Should we settings. have audio um hmm audios the reason why I'm there here we today go. is because I'm one of the Linux platform yes, we have and I'm gonna talk to you a bit about uh, Linux publishing okay and Unity 4 so this is um, one of the developers at you at uh, at uh, Unity 3D, not Unity the desktop environment, okay. but Unity the 3D engine for games. Right. And she held a presentation uh, at Unite, their developers summit, about Linux. Oh, okay. And okay. some of the things coming to Linux and some of the issues around that. Now it was a 38 minute talk. Wow. And the bulk of it is sort of uh, Linux basics to sort of introduce people to Linux. So okay. Well, not necessarily nice. a fit for our crowd. Sure. So sure. I thought what I would do is I went through and I picked out a couple of the highlight moments oh. from that from her talk to kind of just show us where things are going. So nice. one of the first questions that I found interesting and I thought was a little insightful is uh, she was asked uh, where they see distribution support at. Right. So in terms of distribution support, which is another common question, uh, officially at Unity we offer support for Ubuntu 10.10 .10 or later. There's nothing special about 10.10, .10 except that that's the version of uh, of Ubuntu that was installed in our automated build farm whenever we started doing this. I think with 4.2, it might actually go back to 10.04 because we changed the version of, of Linux installed. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, the player runs without problems on a wide range of Linux desktops. Uh, I've seen users, like Arch Linux was actually a, a distribution that I didn't really expect to be represented in any statistics, but there's a, a small number, but a visible number of, of users there. Um, we have a lot of users obviously using Gentoo and hmm. Debian, very old versions of versions of Linux I wouldn't have expected to be installed on a desktop at all, like CentOS. And, and CentOS, we got CentOS Cent gamers CentOS. out there. So uh, that was the <laughs> insights on distros. Art sounds like it's uh, been represented as well. Then she was asked, uh, has, have they gotten any kind of feeling for what games and genre of mm -hmm. games are doing well on Linux? Now, it doesn't sound like they have direct metrics based on their um, Unity engine. The, the Unity player actually has the capability of collecting metrics on the user's hardware and software, right. but when they turned that on, they got so many metrics that it actually crashed their, crashed oh, wow. their metric server. Oh, my goodness. But they do kind of have a feeling for what games do the best on Linux, and so she answered that question. One of the least successful type, or one of the least successful genres is going to be first-person shooters because that's like not because they're not good and not because we don't enjoy playing them, but I think that first-person shooters have existed for a long time on Linux, but now um, there's opportunity for you know different types of games in different genres. So, uh, for example, when Late last year, I was at the uh, the Ubuntu Developer Summit, and uh, we showed part of uh, a game reel, um, and it included games, for example, like Dead Trigger, which people kind of thought was funny, but then, um, yeah, there were lots of uh, oohs and ahs about other games like Splice and uh, ones like that. So, uh, in my opinion, I would say that thinking, I guess, away from the games we traditionally had on Linux, like first-person shooters and things like that. Um, I know RC Mini Racers, which is a racing game, um, sold um, pretty well on the Ubuntu Software Center, and I think that's because like hmm. racing games just aren't prominent on Linux. So she proposes that uh, certain racing game or certain certain types of games, like racing games, are going to do well on Linux, but the first-person shooters, ah, we've got we've seen too many of those, and maybe they won't do as well. I would disagree, and I think yeah. a lot of our audience probably would. As probably well. depends on the first-person shooter, right? I think that's really it. I think it depends on the title. It depends on the audience. It depends on a number of factors. Yeah. I wouldn't blanket yeah. it quite much so much. Yeah, I mean, like if Halo came or something like that, yeah. some huge title like that came to links, it'd probably sell. Oh yeah, yeah. I, there's no no question of it. I mean, although for casual gaming, like she mentioned that the race car game did particularly well in the Ubuntu. So I could see like if there's a new uh, like you know side scroller games right now. I'm picking up a lot of those. There's right. so there's definitely like I want new types of games. Sure. 
maybe what it is is just since there's so many first person shooters, the bar is higher for it to get to go successful. Well, I think yeah, I think that's just it's because you kind of have your old favorites and you've already got your established teammates and your established friends, and they're, you're all going to the same place. So yeah, there needs to be something new and compelling to make you try that new thing. I think. Yeah. All right, so uh, last clip from the conference is features coming to uh, Unity games. For Another Linux. thing is that in um, Unity 4.2, webcam support for Linux also exists, the same as it does for the other desktop machines or desktop uh, platforms. Um, a couple of things we want to work on in the future are better Steam integration. This is not actually uh, so specific to Linux, but uh, it's something that I care a lot about now that Steam is out for Linux. Um, a, a lot of our users have a lot of trouble uh, getting everything to work nicely with like the Steam API and, 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 and things like that. So I'd like to figure out a way to, to, to possibly work with Valve or do whatever we need to do to figure out how to integrate that uh, better and make the process less painful. And then finally, um, I would really like to optimize for open source drivers. They don't have the same capabilities that the propri proprietary drivers do. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't provide as good of a user experience as possible. I mean, actually, the, the user experience for many games is, is quite good already with open source drivers, but we haven't really invested resources in optimizing uh, for the open source drivers. So uh, that's one thing that I'm, I would really like to do and hoping to do uh, later on in the, in the Forex cycle. But. So there you go. Yes. So they're gonna, they haven't been spending a lot of time on the open source drivers specifically yet, mm. but coming soon. And I think that's really good. I because think that's a fair approach. Uh, you know, they probably got to focus on the hardcore gamers first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right, Matt. Well, I thought before we got out of the news, we just talked about some proprietary, yeah. pro probably proprietary games if they using Unity Engine. Why don't we talk about an open source game and one Ooh. that's one that's kind of popular in the Jupiter Broadcasting community? Matt, have you heard of Zononic or Zonic? I think we've, no, I haven't. I think we talked about it, but it's been a long time since we talked about it on the show. It's not ringing a bell. I'm all right. Well, so. Um, Zononic is an open source first person shooter. Oh, okay. we just talked about first person shooters, right? <laughs> See? Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, it just hit version 0 0.7, and it uh, it's based on the Quake 3 engine, but highly optimized and modified. Oh, okay. And it's got uh, we have a Jupiter Broadcasting server, which I'll show you here in just a sec. Yeah. So this is the first uh, this is the first release in a little while. It's a massive step forward for the project. They've changed their team structure and they've brought new development talent in, which is awesome. They're going to yeah. pick up release and they're going to have uh, more frequent release cycles. Massive updates to new game modes, new animation blending, more competitive features, mapping updates, nice. better handling of game messaging. Why don't we take a look? So I'll, yeah, I'll load it up for you here. All right. So let me see if I can remember how to start it. Okay. Uh, Zononic. And then you have, oh, yeah. Okay. So then you have uh, Linux 64. Makes and then sense. I probably want GLX, I would assume. Because I likes me the GLX. Start the nice smooth. Ooh. All smooth. right. Smooth. My uh, dock bar is going to hang out, but that's okay. That's all right. So if we go into multiplayer here and then we search for Jupiter Broadcasting, should see us in here, I think. Maybe. Maybe. Watch us not there this morning. Oh, there it is, Jupiter there Broadcasting. Is. All right, there's nobody in there right now because everybody's watching last. Right? Right? That's okay. okay. That's okay. That's all right. That's okay. Uh, which, so this, our server is uh, one version behind, I think. But you kind of get an idea for, That's for cool, what though. it looks like. It's nice yeah. that we have one. So Zononic is free, it's open source, and it's really fast-paced. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's just like Unreal Tournament on speed. And or Quake kinda, 3. Qu oh, it's Quakey. Yeah. yeah, okay, it's got more of a Quakey feel to it, actually. Very Quakey. So let's see if I can find me a bot. There's a bot. Oh, my gosh, that guy's really <laughs> Oh, he got me. He tagged. All right, so I'm not so good. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go, Matt? Oh, right, you tagged him. So uh, the the head you there. can see the colors are intense. The speed yeah. is nuts. I mean, this is this kind of game is like it can make you motion sick. Oh yeah. If you're if you're the type of person who's likely. Well, I think if you're if you're used to qu uh, kind of a quake situation, I think this is very uh, you're, you're you're able to handle it. But yeah, definitely take your quakes. <laughs> yeah, take your Dramamine. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, so there you go. That's Zononic version seven or uh, version zero dot seven. Okay. And uh, I got, I'll get out of here. I'm done fragging people. <laughs> I like you know any excuse I get to frag people during the news segment. Absolutely. Matt. And we'll have a link to all of the stories we covered as well as the full uh, unite session if you want to see her uh, full. I pulled out some of the goodies, but there's other stuff in there as well. You can go watch that. We have all that Good linked stuff. in the show notes. All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. This week, we'll tell you how to turn everyone's favorite lovable Raspberry Pi into mm. a portable anonymizer using the Tor network. And there's a couple of different approaches. One is super, super easy, and one roll your own. Nice. Cover both of those. But before we do that, yes. I want to thank this segment sponsor, System76, who if you haven't, if you've been living under some sort of massive rock 
for the last week. Maybe you missed the fact that they just l- released some brand new machines, including how do you Glago? How do you say that? Glago? I called the I just called the Ultra Pro. The I Ultra get, Pro. Yeah, the Ultra Pro because I'm not Check sure. Check it out. It is gorgeous. It is. This is a nice looking rig with a 1080p IPS display, Haswell generation Core i7 processor, uh-huh. the new HD 40. A 5200 Intel GPU, which I'm hearing amazing things about. It's going to be great for gaming, great for portability, all that stuff. Look at this map. 14.1-inch screen Crazy. with 1080p, full res. That is going to be so tight and crisp. It's going nice to be resolution on it. And one, a couple of uh, instances where they actually compared it to other Ultrabooks, because oh, a yeah. lot of people were saying, well, sure. what's the difference? And it's like, there are some significant oh, yeah. differences in power. Oh, yeah. differences. This is this, not only is the design look absolutely stunning and beautiful, but uh, talk about ultimate power in a portable rig. And of course, it's mm-hmm. machine designed to run Linux. That's what right. I love about these System76 machines. Other vendors out there might try to get into these niche markets where they exactly. have a niche product for their niche customers. And there's other companies who live and breathe Linux and they're integrated top to bottom. These guys are at the developer summits giving their input, mm-hmm. watching the progress of things because they're integrated in with the community. Right. One of the things I love about System76 Plus these new awesome rigs go check out the new well i we're gonna call it the ultra pro the ultra pro go yeah. check out the new ultra pro yeah, yeah that's right yeah. it's awesome i've been i have been salivating at that bad yes. boy a great work the system 76 team you guys that Nicely looks like done. an awesome rig um On my all wish right list. so here we go i have right. uh right here if you're watching the video version i've got this do 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 raspberry pi mm. and the one thing that i'm doing that uh is sort of making this a little more portable than your average bear is i've connected it to uh this motorola dock this oh, that's laptop interesting. Dock. And this laptop dock, both the both the Pi right. and the laptop dock were provided by the awesome Q5Sys in our uh, chat room right and on. in the subreddit. He sent these in. And so I've linked, uh, if you want to grab this rig, this setup, I've got a starter kit for the Raspberry Pi that's linked in the show notes as well as the Motorola dock, which is awesome. It adds oh, hours yeah. of battery life. And, and then you just need some HDMI connectors. Yeah. And uh, for the complete thing that I'm doing today, you'll also need... If you want to do this, this little USB Wi-Fi dongle that you yeah, I was looking at that. Uh, yeah, it's tiny. Thing. Plugs into the USB port on the back of the uh, laptop dock. Well, and I like the mobile little antenna, and it looks like what is that? Probably a Mar- Marvel. I, I don't. It's supported. Whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, whatever it is works out of the, the box. The Raspbian. Uh, yeah. uh, this is so. This has got the Raspbian, the Debian version oh, cool. of the Raspberry Pi on the SD card here, and I've got uh, my power, my HDMI, and my Ethernet. Mm-hmm. And my USB, and they're all hooked nice. up to this a Motorola lap dock. And now when I open up the lap dock here, it'll actually power up the Raspberry Pi. And what's so awesome about this is then the then the whole Raspberry Pi, I'm not plugged into any power source. Oh, okay, so it's, there's no power. It, it's all being powered by the lap dock. The lap dock also acts as the HDMI output screen, and the keyboard acts as the mouse input and the trackpad, or as obviously the keyboard and mouse, so they both work all on the Raspberry Pi. So you have a complete portable computer at this point. So this is just the front end to the Pi, essentially. This yeah. Really. Okay. So you could do this you could do this headless as well. You oh, know. Yeah. Um but I, I like since I'm doing the setup portion of this, I like having it right here on on the machine. Now I'm I'm going to turn this into a Tor proxy. Whoa. And my idea would be that this sits, say, on your home network, mm-hmm. and it's available to the machines on your home network so that when you want to connect to the Tor network, you don't have to load a particular package or anything like that on your mm-hmm. computer. You just connect to this machine, and it does all your Tor proxying for you, and then when you're done, you disconnect. That's handy. Yeah. Nice. And I like the idea of taking this Wi-Fi signal right. and make it an AP. And oh, anything that's connected right. to this AP is automatically routed out to the Tor network. So that way, if you have an, an existing AP already set up for yeah. regular stuff, but you want your covert AP. Yeah. Ah, and, yeah. And so then this is really nice for portable devices, mm. tablets, Android devices, you know, anything like that, anything, a laptop that has right. Wi-Fi, whenever you connect to this AP, you're, you're browsing over the Tor network. Oh, that's cool. I mean, the options are really limitless. You could theoretically, let's say you've already set up a mobile hotspot somewhere, and then you want to uh, uh, then connect with this. Oh man, I left I mean, my could... Arch SD card in there, Matt. Oh, gonna... see, this is the Father's Day chaos here. Uh-oh. I'm just going to close that. <laughs> so uh, you got to have the right SD card in there for uh-huh. this to work. But I'll... so there's two options. Okay. The one that I went with, and this is this is the easy way. All right, I like these. This way. is the easy way. It's called well, Torberry. 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 It's hosted on Google hmm. Code. Uh, Torberry is a Raspbian-based distribution for the Raspberry Pi devices whose main purpose is to serve as a Tor transparent proxy that routes all your TCP and DNS through the Tor network. Oh, nice. The main advantage is that only Tor traffic is sent mm. and received from the internet, making it harder to disclose your IP address. That's, you know, the main advantage is nice. Tor. So this is an image that you just DD to the SD card, and it boots up 
all configured with Tor. Oh, it so automatically that's connects out of the box. Out of the box, it connects up. It, it's got a great little Tor logo on it, and uh, you could now you could like I was rolling this on my own in Arch just as an experiment, wow. but with, with this with Torberry, everything everything's ready to go. I went through all the configs. Everything looks legit. Wow. It doesn't look like they're sneaking anything in there. I did right. some TCP dumps to see where stuff was sending. I didn't see anything bogus, uh, so I I had a good feeling about it. So I emailed the uh, developer. And I just said, hey, I noticed, you know, Torberry looking like a really good project. I've yeah. seen a lot of interest around this right now, but uh, I haven't seen you update it since May. That's, a con- that's yeah, something to definitely find out about. So I wrote him back. He said, hi, yes, Torberry is under active development, okay. but I'm the only developer, so no f- new features depend on my spare time. Mm. It's in its early stages, some of the things that are on the to-do list. Set up Torberry as an onion router to help Tor with bandwidth. This is oh, a feature okay. coming really soon. Uh, he also says uh, possibly connect to the Torberry to a computer directly so you could do USB to USB connections. Oh, so then you just plug in the USB port and your computer routes through that. Uh, hmm. Hot st- ha- uh, host tap support to convert uh, Torberry into a wireless router. That would be cool. So it doesn't out of the box do the wireless AP thing, but I'm going right. to get you covered on that in a okay. second. But okay. that'd be really great. And that then improve cool. the web interface with a decent config package. He has a very, he has a very basic web UI to it mm-hmm. right now that gives you the status, tells you you can you can regenerate your mm-hmm. Tor connections. That way you come from a new source. It's pretty vanilla. Yeah, it's very vanilla. But he's working on it. So that's okay. Torberry. You load that on the SD card, and it gives you. Uh, and then, uh, and I, it, you actually can get it up and running. I have the uh, notes here in the show notes uh, with three commands. You could just manually route. Oh. Your machine through your Tor proxy. That's so cool. Yeah, literally, it's like three commands. Yeah, super easy. But let's say, let's say you want to kick things up, right? You right. want to, you want to see if maybe, uh, maybe you could uh, do this uh, through the wireless AP. Now he doesn't have his guide yet, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I have linked to a really great uh, guide that was. Uh, boy, these guys have been really big on Google Plus recently too. Yeah. Uh, let's see where are they here. It is, uh, yeah. A- have you add a fruit? Have you heard of these add fruit guys? Add a fruit. No, yeah. it's not ringing a bell. All right, so at, I have I'll, in the show notes. I've linked a guide from Add a Fruit. If you follow this, they have two separate guides. One that gets you the Tor routing stuff mm-hmm. that gets you all going on that, and the other that gets you the wireless stuff. So it's two separate guides you have to follow. Okay. To be able to do Pretty reasonable, this. but yeah, once you follow through their guides. You'll have a wireless AP set up, and it's, uh, it, what it involves is installing DHCP, mm-hmm. so installing some AP configuration software, and then doing some IP tables routing commands, so that way all of the connections that come in on the wireless interface are routed through the Tor interface. Uh, okay, it's, that it's, makes sense. It's pretty simple, and so you can follow this guide to A, just set up your Raspberry Pi as a Wi-Fi right. access point. And then you use the commands in the second tutorial to route everything through the wireless access point over the Tor network. Sweet. And then whenever you connect to that AP, you're automatically routing through Tor. Oh, that's cool. Now, because these are, you know, it's, it's a process of installing packages mm-hmm. and uh, configuring your IP tables. We're not going to walk through it right now. Right. But it's it's pretty straightforward. All the commands are listed here for you. They even go through, like, what kind of prerequisite things you need. Like, that's handy because then you're not caught with the right. missing something. Right. You know? And uh, they've got some. They've got mm-hmm. some very simple guides for you now. So, you will need a Pi to, in order to do this particular functionality with the Wi-Fi routing. You will need a Raspberry Pi that has an Ethernet port because right. you have to route the Tor traffic over Ethernet, and then you accept connections over Wi-Fi. And what I like about this setup here, Matt, is th- I could slid. I could slide this into my laptop bag. See, uh, Q5 says put a little. Uh, he put some Velcro on this thing. Oh, so yes. you can you can Velcro the Pi to it, and then you can just slide in the laptop bag. It's totally uh, oh, totally cool. battery powered. Now the only thing is, is if uh, if you if you're doing the AP thing, you got to then slide an Ethernet that's cord true. into the that bag. That's true. <laughs> that, that's not a big deal. Usually they come with two. Zippers. That might look a little suspicious. In. Security guy might walk by. And like, Why does that guy have Ethernet in right. his bag? Uh, but anyways, uh, Adafruit uh, Learning System has some great guides. If you guys want to, if you guys want to take it to the next level, but go check out Torberry. It's under active development, yeah. and it's just an SD card right away. You just write to the card and boot it up and uh, check it out. Easy to follow guide. Get it done. Yeah. The uh, let's see. Just so you don't get stuck, if you use the Torberry image, uh, the username is root, and I believe the password was uh, just raspberry. Oh, okay. It took me a while to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, pa- the password would throw me off. No, I'm sorry. The Wait. Well, no. Could it be root root or? I don't remember now. It's been, mm-hmm. It was because uh, I changed it. I changed it right away. But I would oh, recommend okay. changing it right away. But if you Google search, uh, if you Google search Torberry root password, you'll find it. That's what I had to do, and it was it was in a discussion thread. So that's uh, that's two different ways to get this going, and they're nice. both really awesome. Gets you, you know, Tor is at least part of an overall security solution right. to anonymize yourself. I know this has been a big topic for a lot of you guys recently. You use this solution; it's portable and it's a dedicated rig. And when the Raspberry Pis are like twenty five, thirty bucks, yeah, it's a no brainer. No brainer. All right, Matt. That's the Linux Action Show's look at keeping you anonymous online. Oh, 
Hi, everybody. So for those of you who are following my Switch to Arch adventure, you might remember during that adventure that I said I'm pretty happy, but I'd love to find a backup solution where I could then upgrade my Arch system with ultimate confidence. And I'm not even so worried about Arch breaking as I am about GNOME 3.8 breaking. I love my GNOME setup. There it is right there. And uh, I've got all the extensions I want just the way I want it. I'm actually very, very happy with this setup, but I'm honestly worried that one day I'm going to upgrade something and it's going to break. So I, th I thought I'd play around with different solutions to solve this problem. And since I'm doing this on a laptop, I wanted something portable, something secure, something that I could just sort of fire off before I need to do a package update. So I had sort of manual control over it, but it wouldn't have to do a full backup every time. So I had a few different requirements of what I was trying to accomplish, and I think I have found just the right tool. So I wanted to cover it with you, tell you why it's working for me, and maybe point you in the right direction. So if you want to check it out, you can. Before we do that, I want to thank this week's sponsor of Slash Etsy, and that's Untangle. Yeah, that's right. Go to untangle.com slash last and check out Untangle. These are Linux firewalls powered by the amazing Linux, but then wrapped in a beautiful presentation layer that really makes it easy for a novice or an expert to manage these firewalls. They use this rack concept, so people are familiar with server racks. They're going to totally know that metaphor translates to the UI of Untangle, and it's super easy to use. Look, if you don't have the Untangle ISO yet, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? Go over to Untangle.com and download that ISO. It's free. You can load it on any box you want and check out what the Untangle firewall can do. And then when you're like, dang, this is really nice, then later on when you're ready to, you know, upgrade to the big boy stuff, you can get yourself an appliance. they got the U10, the U150, which we've checked out is awesome. All these different appliances are great because then you can put them in a rack. You don't have to worry about heat. You don't have to worry about power because they're super, super convenient. They're designed to run in a data center. Now, when you're over at untangle.last, you can get yourself 20% off one of their yearly subscriptions. These yearly inscriptions include things like awesome packet filtering, amazing site blocking, content and oh, analysis, bandwidth usage. All, I mean, the list goes on and on. What they can do is far and above beyond what the competitors can do. So go over to untangle.com slash last. Just check it out and see what they get. And then when you decide, all right, I'm ready to get one of those awesome annual services. Just use the code LAST20 when you check out and you'll save 20% off. Thanks to Untangle for sponsoring slash Etsy. I want to tell you about Duplicity. Now, I picked Duplicity for a couple of reasons. You might be familiar with it because a lot of people use Duplicity with rsync. You, you combine these two things up. Maybe you send it over to an SSH server that you have and you use SFTP and it uh, sends it over Handy dandy. In fact, here's their tagline. Encrypted bandwidth efficient backups using the rsync algorithm. Well, number one, I like encryption. Number two, bandwidth efficiency. I'm all about that. And you know what? I like everything else about rsync too. So this is a win-win for me. If you look at the features, one of the things that jumped out at me right away is they support a lot of different file storage backends. So you can do local file storage. So if you want to do like a USB drive or something like that, and you just wanted to back up to that, that's no problem. But they also support SFTP, rsync, webdav, and the one I'm picking, Amazon S3. Now, because Duplicity does all of the encryption locally and the compression, and it's very bandwidth efficient, this shouldn't be too costly. I'm just backing up my slash root. I'm not going to back up my home. I figure all of the package updates that I'm worried about, and all the configuration changes I'm worried about, will happen on my slash home. And the other thing I love about Duplicity is it doesn't require a GUI, sort of like Back in Time does and some of the other applications. And the reason why that's key, why the reason why that is key is I suspect at some point, I'm going to blow up X11. I'm going to blow up GNOME, and I'm not going to be able to log in. And I want to be able to command line restore from my previous snapshot. So I'll fire off this script I'm going to create before every big upgrade, and then run it, a, a restore script, if I have problems. And the reason I chose S3 is, well, quite frankly, I'm on a laptop, right? I don't know if I'm going to be on my home network where I can back up to my free NAS box. I just don't know what my situation is going to be, but I should always have a connection to S3. And I like that it's also off-site, and since it's encrypted before it goes, I'm not too worried about it. So the way I, the approach I decided to take was I did some digging and I found this, of course, awesome Arch wiki on Duplicity. It can get you pointed in the right direction for a lot of this stuff. It includes a very nice sample backup script if you're going to do something over SCP, which is fine for you folks. However, because I wanted to do S3, I went and found a blog post and it's actually written for Fedora users. But you know what? If you just skip past the RPM stuff, then it applies to any distro. Ubuntu, Arch, doesn't matter. You go down here and see what he's done is he's created a shell script where you export out your passphrase and your Amazon S3 access keys as, as these variables. You, put, you export them out here, right? Which is brilliant because then you don't have to type them in on the command line every single time. 
And then he has the directories he wants to back up. In his case, he's doing his SVN. In my case, I'm putting my root in there. He also is doing, uh, if older than 30 days, do a full backup. I've taken that out of my script. I just want to be able to roll back. Now, I, I think this is important maybe to point out here. I don't think this should be considered a full backup, right? If this is the only other copy I have, I don't think that counts as a full backup. You need to be able to have iterations of files and things like that. That's not my intention here. My intention here is just to recover from a bad update or something like that. So I have filled out, I have essentially taken the script, which I have linked in the show notes, for you guys. I've taken the script and modified it. I've put my super secret Amazon S3 info in there. And uh, I uh, made a little executable script, which I'll be throwing in uh, in a directory that I can run before or add to my cron if I wanted to. I don't necessarily think I need to cron this, but you could. I mean, it makes it really easy once it's in a shell script like this. So let me show you how I do this. So I've already created that shell script. I'm not showing it to you because it has my super secret password in there. And for ease of use, I've just dropped the uh, script in my uh, root directory because, you know, that's how I roll. And let me see. Can I yeah, see here, guys? I'll see here. Hold on. Hold on. Wait for it. Zoom in. I'll make the text a little bigger for you. Yeah, there you go. Huh? Yeah. Maybe zoom in one more. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. Now you're seeing everything, aren't you? You can see it all. Mm-hmm. So there is my script. I call it dupe.sh. So I'm going to run dupe.sh. And because I've plugged all this stuff in there, Duplicity says, oh, I see, by the way, I already I started it once before, and then I'm restarting it, you know, I'm doing a little TV magic for you guys, but Duplicity says, huh, I've actually already been working on this a little bit, let me just restart where I left off at this individual volume. And then Bob's your uncle, it's taken off. Yes, yes. Actually, it looks like it's backing up my home directory. So one thing that this script is not going to do, which I need to work on, is I would like, I would like to, whoa, hi there. I would like to come up with um, ways to exclude my var log and uh, my op directory because I got like a ton of Steam games in there. So this is sort of early days of the script. I just kind of set this up about 15 minutes ago. So I would go through there and I'm gonna I'm gonna exclude those types of things. You'd probably want to do something like that yourself. So if you have if you have a script kind of similar to this, or if you have directories, especially you Arch users that you have found just are totally safe and totally acceptable to exclude from your backups, leave me a comment so that way I can read those and I can kind of adjust my script. Because like on on a Debian system, I totally wouldn't get the apt cache, right? That makes sense. Why why back up the apt cache? I'm thinking things like that for Arch and you know var log. That seems kind of obvious. Temp, not to get temp, but anything kind of like that that you guys have, let me know, and I'll try to incorporate that into my script. I I don't know. I've been watching this. You know, I can get about a megabit up to Amazon S3. So I'm going to kind of see how long it takes to do that first backup. But my hope is all future backups, just the changes, just the differences. So it should be very quick to run this before I do a big package management upgrade. But we'll see. It's all kind of a work in progress. I'm going to continue to play with these things, and I'll keep you guys updated as I come across different backup solutions. But for right now, I'm giving Duplicity a big thumbs up, even if you don't use the S3 features. Even if you don't, for some reason, want the S3 features. Look at all these other great capabilities it has. Duplicity looks really awesome. So that's, uh, there you go. That's my backup solution for my Archbox, and that wraps up Slash Etsy. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, before we get out of here, yes, a couple of uh, quick follow-ups from the slash Etsy segment that just played. Uh, so, um, by the way, in my uh, duplicity settings, you want to make sure. I decided I'm going to change it so I only back up specific directories. So I'd love to hear your suggestions of the mm -hmm. directories I back up. And I also thought yeah, this uh, playing with the Raspberry Pi has got me using SD cards in my Bonobo recently. Oh, and yeah. I didn't realize the way this Bonobo's SD card reader works is the card goes almost all the way in. Which is just great, So right? I could get mm -hmm. like a 32 gig or whatever card and yeah. back up to that. Which is just boom. That's so like mind blown. I'm thinking I'm going to use Duplicity to write to the SD card and to write to S3. So I have a local backup. So that way if I want to do a quick restore and then something offsite that is also just in case, right? But yeah, that's great because the local is going to give you the speed for recovery. Yeah. But of course, that goes... Which I'm going to want to pinch, yeah. Right. So that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm like thinking. It. All right. Now let's get to some of the emails we got this week. Uh, first one was actually a, submit, a subreddit post, which is great. Uh, Jacob Brocker Brocker. writes... Uh, all the news about the NSA has me thinking of going with hosting my own email server. What hardware would you recommend? System 76 has a lot of options, mm -hmm. but what would I need to consider for space, speed, and energy consumption? User base would be a family, about 16 active users with several gigs of storage per user. I'd like to offer them unlimited storage. My technical level isn't very high. To give you an idea of where I'm at, I'm the guy who installs Ubuntu desktop and then runs terminal commands for adding server-side software. I, I like having a GUI. Please don't hold that against me. Um, 
Boy. So we got some good recommendations in here. I want to talk about a couple of things. First okay. of all, when you run your own email server, you need to be aware that a lot of ISPs block the email ports. Um, and also a lot of email services like Hotmail and Gmail and Comcast and AOL and Yahoo and all these guys, when they see emails originating from a home uh, consumer uh, ISP IP address, they often will just automatically block you. Right. That's a red flag to them. Yeah. Sure. Um, and setting up an email server can be um, kind of a, a, a it's it's a, it's a long it's a long process. Email is uh, if you do it right, it's it's very involved. Uh, running your own server is a lot of work, as Windy Power put it. And uh, he says, if this is your first time doing it, I strongly advise you do it for a domain that you don't already have active use for communications. Sure. Be ready to accept losing email for the first week or so because it will certainly happen. Hmm. So think about that. Maybe try experimenting first before you switch over family because email is this funny thing where. Everybody thinks they assign a priority to how important email is. Like, oh yeah, email's important. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, email's Not important. So much, right? Oh yeah. And then and then they lose their email for like half the day. And then all of a sudden it becomes like four times more important than mm -hmm. they ever thought it was. And they're they're breathing down your neck. Doesn't matter if it's your significant other or your mother in law. Email becomes critically important because of course somebody has something absolutely last minute they're wor they're waiting for or need. So before you jump into the shark's pit, uh, you might try running it. On something that's a little less critical. Maybe uh, I want to expanding on that. Maybe uh, whatever you're using now for email, keep that as your primary and kind of set up a little testing, a little yeah, bit of a okay. family test. Yeah, back there and you forth. go. That way, if things go belly up, well then, no big, no big deal. And uh, check out Roundcube, which mm, is pretty yes. cool. And Squirrel Mail, those are good I like ones too. Yeah. All Maybe right. Uh, so uh, 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 Z Spaceman wants to know how the Arch Challenge is going for y'all. Hello, mm. all. How is the Arch Challenge and the Arch Lifestyle been working out for you? I myself used Arch for two for nine months or so. Mm -hmm. I left for Ubuntu. It was one big thing that made me leave. It was many. It wasn't one big thing. It was many little things. Sure, sure. Uh, so he was curious. How is the Arch Challenge going for us? And we had some other people in here who, you know, I've been using it for years and years. But right. Matt, how is the Arch Challenge going uh, for you? You know, it's it's fine. It's it's not really that compelling. I mean, I keep you know a Clonezilla image, of course, and I try and I someone advised me to keep that uh, redo and kind of redo that every couple of weeks just to keep things fresh. So I keep that as kind of a backup. And then generally when I'm upgrading, I just make sure to really keep an eye on the packages. Anything that's kind of thrown up a red flag at me as a package that might create problems when I upgrade, I'll, I'll make a note of it. I'll jot it down. That way, if I need to roll back, no big deal. Thus far, cross my fingers, mm -hmm. um, not too bad. Yeah, so. not so bad. I, I have had one one thing that would seem like, really, it's 2013 and this is still an issue, is uh, when I plug in an SD card into my SD card reader, uh, I see it show up in D messages as a device. Sure, right. um, and I added some auto scripts to my UDEV settings so that way it's supposed to auto mount them. Okay. So doesn't. Part's done. It's not doing it. Doesn't auto mount, doesn't show up in the Nautilus sidebar. And to me, I, I almost feel like that's something that I shouldn't even have to bother with anymore. Like, it right. just seems like the system should be like, oh, I've detected a new media device was added. It's this type of media device. Let me automatically take care of that. That would be one of those things for myself that's a pet peeve. Even on an advanced distro to where yeah. I'm willing to do a lot of stuff myself, That it's it's just myself personally. That'd definitely be a pet peeve. It just yeah. Anything where I feel like, oh, this is a problem that we solved back in 1989. And when right. and I'm just, when I, when I feel like, okay, this was solved 25 years yeah. ago and it's, still has to be done manually that then i go from oh man it's so cool and it's customizable to it's just not really fully you know baked. well and you did do your homework as far as setting it up it's not well, like you just plugged in and expected it. i you, thought you, i did you, you mean you, you I did make the, the effort i, I went mean, to the you, arch yeah. wiki on removable devices right. i went to the arch wiki on udev exactly. i went and you know i've I dug around there and i made the changes i thought i was supposed to make obviously i missed something um and and part of it I, i'll be completely honest with you is i have really no interest in making it work and it's it's actually it's minor enough that I thought if when it got to the fifteen minute mark I thought and now I've just crossed the threshold for how long it would take me to install Ubuntu and it would just work out of the box <laughs> right. and I started to get a little mad so I just stopped sure. and I haven't gone back to it and right. I don't know it's just to me uh, to me that's like when I what it was is honestly I was working I had I had a couple of hours last yesterday yet yeah, last yesterday I'm sounding like my son I had a couple of hours yesterday after I I reloaded uh, Arch on this thing and I right. wanted to try to get uh, the Raspberry uh, uh, Onion Router stuff working on this SD card right, yeah. and the fact that I blew 20 minutes of it just trying to get my SD card reader to mount I thought was stupid 
Well, and I would agree. So then I, I mean, just mounted yeah. it manually and did the, you know, it was done. Yeah. I just thought, yeah. Well, because, I mean, you, you know, you did all the things you're supposed to. You went through the documentation. You went yeah. through the wiki. It's not like you just plugged in and said, oh, that worked. I mean, you did try to go through the motions of making sure that this is being done properly. And, and despite the documentation, it's not working. It's kind of like, that's kind of a, bu- that's got, that's a buzzkill. I mean, there's no question of that. I'd, yeah. I'd be a little irked. Yeah. I'd be actually, I'd be really pissed, actually. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> so I just moved on, yeah. you know. And that's um, probably, that's what I have to do. Sometimes I just be like, you know what? I'll come back yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know, I mean, really. if I get to the point where I feel like I've got nothing yeah. better to do other than troubleshoot something that shouldn't be a problem at all, then I'll probably take care of it. But I'm betting. And if there's an I easy won't. fix for it, hey, God, you know, do a, yeah. do a Reddit thing on it. We're all about it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe I just missed something. If there's something yeah. really easy, I'd love to know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it doesn't have to be super easy, but if it's just, you know, you give, know. give us the few lines we need to. If yeah. you could, if you have sure. any tips that are more than go read the wiki and don't link me to the wiki because I've already read the wiki. <laughs> yeah. You want to get smacked? Yeah, it's a fast track to that. Yeah. That irks me. Uh, no kidding, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's quite bad. We think like, of that? Everything is in the wiki. But then again, everybody, right. the only help you use, a lot of times you get is the first answer you're as good as they link you to the wiki. It's like, oh, okay. Sometimes you, sometimes it's something you haven't seen. Sometimes it yes. is. The so, guy writes in mm-hmm. about Zorin OS 7. says, hi, Chris and Matt. I've been using Linux for a bit over a year. Mm-hmm. And I've been watching last for several months. Nice. I absolutely love it. Thank you for the weekly awesomeness. Anyways, for most of my time on Linux, I've been running Ubuntu 1204 on my main computer. Okay. But... I'm, a, what is that? Incurable thinker. Tinker. Incurable. Okay. I, he's incurable tinker. Okay. All right, all right. So I try out plenty of other distros for my secondary machine. Sure. Most of the other distros I've played with are ones that you've talked about on your show. For example, Ubuntu, Zubuntu, mm-hmm. Kubuntu, Linux, Mint, OpenSUSE, Debian, Arch, etc. Right. They're all pretty nice. However, I'm typing this on an Ubuntu derivative I've not heard you mention at all on the show. And I absolutely am blown away that it is the, the 12th distro on DistroWatch at the time of this writing and not getting more attention. It's called Zorin OS 7. And he's using uh, the free edition. Hmm. It's an Ubuntu derivative, and dare I say, it's the darn best out-of-the-box experience I've ever had. This is coming from someone who has had Ubuntu for most of his Linux career. Interesting. I've been using the Live City for all 15 minutes, and here's some features... <laughs> Here are some features that make me love this distro already. Right. Number one, the Zorin look changer. With two or three clicks, you can dramatically change how this baby looks. No logging out and back in, no fuss whatsoever. Oh, that's kind of Number cool. two, it's freaking pretty. It sounds pretty, <laughs> but the effects, it sounds petty, but the effects are really nice. Out of the box, in the live CD, the 3D cube I keep hearing about, but can never get to work on Ubuntu works flawlessly. Number three, it's darn fast, scarily fast for me at least. Huh. And number four, everything works out of the box. Everything, wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am, as they say. In conclusion, this distro absolutely rocks. I'm dumbfounded that I have not heard more about it. And to be honest, I'm a bit frustrated it doesn't get more attention. I know that you don't want to kill your Arch installation, but please at least try it on the virtual box and see what you think, because Zorn OS deserves a review. Thank you for making it through my incredibly long-winded novel. Have a nice well, day. Well, I have an old computer. Well, see, that may not run so well on the old computer, but I can at least do it in a virtual box on my, good, on my decent computer. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was world. thinking for the Slash Etsy next week, we'd give it a, uh, mm-hmm. a little quick mm-hmm. review, like a mini review. Yeah, I think so. Okay. It'd be we'll kind of cool that. to kind of experience these features for ourselves, right? Yeah, see what he's saying. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I do like the eye candy, although I've kind of turned, I've kind of tuned it down yeah. over the years. Mainly because, you know, it just... Well, I like composite. the three-click thing without the logging. Yeah, I'll check mm-hmm. that out. I, cool. I'm always a fan on on the takes, although we've we just in the news segment we talked about the issue derivatives in Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, they're going to have a, they could have potentially derivatives could have a rocky next couple of years. Mm, could be could be bumpy. Yeah, a little XORG in the future. So we got lots of feedback on Twitter, G plus, and the emails about our question we threw out there last week. Gary's mod wasn't selling very well, and we thought, what do you mm-hmm. guys think? Well, here's a couple we got. Uh, yeah. This one comes from Yuan Yuan One. Okay. Yuan 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 Yuan. 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 Yeah, he says uh, games on Linux. He says, my, this is my question was thrown out there mm. in the most recent episode, so I thought I'd come here and start thre- start a thread and share my two cents. I'm an average Joe, didn't study computer science school, never heard of Richard Stallman, and have no clue what a Torvalds is. You have 30 seconds to convince me why I want to trade in my iPhone S4 for a Tizen phone, Firefox OS, or a Ubuntu phone. Go! Uh, oops, on second hand, my three-year-old ni- niece is starting a FaceTime video call with me. Okay, back. Sorry. Uh. I think it's basically the same question for Linux gaming. To get people to switch from something that already works very well for them, you can't offer an alternative that is almost as good in the ways that they care about, or even uh. one that has full parity with what they're already used to. Right. You have to come to ta- you have to come to the table with something that is five times better, something that is just smack you in the face better. Yeah, it has I would to agree. take five seconds to sell. What does Steam on Linux offer that a Windows PC gamer that is right. not worth that is worth their time and energy to have them look into the dual boot system or wiping Windows? I can see mm. only one thing that could bring average Joe PC gamers to Linux, Half-Life 3. It's mm. in Valve's hands. We know Valve is working on a Steam box and that you can get an Ubuntu flavor. Um, hmm. 
That's interesting. Maybe. That's a good point. I yeah, that's that's certainly one perspective for sure. Uh, I think you know a title exclusive game absolutely would help. One yeah. thing that the Unity uh, at the Unite conference that Gal was saying, and one thing we've heard from Valve as well, is that uh, both of them said that performance is dramatically better on Windows. So you yeah. could start to see some. Uh, the, what the Unity Gal said is. Uh, she said it's 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 dramatically better than compared to Mac OS X because mm-hmm. of the driver situation in Mac OS X. And she said it's much better than the performance you get in Windows. See, and that's a that's... compelling thing that they need to pitch harder on, um, I think. And if if that is the case, if they're willing to sacrifice, at least immediately, sales on Windows to just launch it on Linux, keep it there for a couple even, of months. Yeah, even if know, it was just for a little while. Just enough to really saturate those Linux guys into saying, hey, this is really cool. i got to use Linux and to try it. Even then, what about like if they said, okay, here's the Half-Life 3 beta. Right. It's going to be in beta on Linux for three months or something like that. Yeah. And then, and that, then see, it, that's reasonable. That's reasonable because yeah. I I know financially they're not going to turn off on the Windows users. They just no, they can't do they it. Can't do that. So yeah, you know I get it, but I think that a little bit of a Linux time, you know, let that bubble in the pot for a That'd while. Be nice. That'd be, be cool. nice. Minato writes in with some more thoughts on the game. He says, mm-hmm. "Yo, Chris and Matt, you posed the question on this last week's last. What yes. seems to be a lukewarm response to gaming on Linux? There's some yeah. truth to that, but for good reasons. First, there are a lot of, or you really, uh, there are first, there are a lot of current generation blockbuster titles available for Linux. While I love some indie games, I really want Bioshock and other big titles from launch day. Without right. those, I have to maintain a Windows box to get." the games when they launch. So I think he's basically in agreement that he's really wanting to see these games launch on Linux, be, you know, yeah. be really part of the Linux experience. I got to admit, I, I installed, see, what, what gets me is yeah. I go out and download the Windows trial. Right. You can run it for 120 days without having to license it long enough for me to play a game and then I wipe it. Right. And that's what I, exactly what I did with Bioshock Infinite. Exactly. I, and sometimes I buy stuff on Steam now thinking, well, maybe if they ever release it on Linux, I can get it through Steam. That's true. So he says, secondarily, we don't have the numbers. And I'm not talking about free cash numbers either. <laughs> he says, uh, the install base for the home desktop, or put more directly, home gaming rigs at Linux is super small compared to Windows. And this is a good point, too. Like, sure. Linux gamers are a niche of the Linux niche. It's not that we don't exist or that we are unwilling to buy. It's just that there are still second class ci- we're still second-class citizens to game developers, and it shows. Mm-hmm. As much as I hate to say, Ubuntu may be able to change that. How much damage it does uh, to its own community along the way is a different story altogether. Right. They might have a key. They might be the keystone to Linux going mainstream until that happens, or another distro makes it happen. We will be on the fringes, buying our indie games, and continuing our mainstream gaming on other platforms. Well, and I think what they're going to have to do, and this is how I would structure it, if I was if I was looking to really launch this out, and I'm not going to rely solely on the Steam box, which is awesome, but that's that's a totally apples and oranges kind of thing. Right now, you have a really great opportunity with that rolling turd known as Windows 8. I mean, mm-hmm. the thing's just a craptastic. Mm-hmm. Put a little bit of dollars into a customized, uh, based on Ubuntu, whatever you want, but basically a, a, a ISO that I can take, drop this on a CD, and I'm going to have a Steam experience that is going to basically allow me to uh, run this, not necessarily live, but I can install it over Windows 8. I'm going to get the same basic functionality that I got with my browser and all that sort of stuff, but it's going to have all the stuff that I want pre-configured, ready to go. Um, but it's very very much branded with that Steam experience. To us, that would seem like, who cares? But I think to Joe Average, I think actually getting that out there and having it all set up and ready to go, yeah. you select your hardware from a pull-down menu, you select your video card, it's already set up and tweaked and whatnot, making that easier, you know, that might help. That might help. I, I think the big problem is that you're you're telling people to not rely on uh, their you know, to kind of cut that cord with the Windows experience. And that's that's really tough for people to do. I mm-hmm. mean, I run into that with a lot of folks. I think you know? I think uh, I think the problem might solve itself just on the direction Microsoft's going. I yeah. you gotta figure that's true. They might take care of it for you. They they seem to be less and less interested in making a really good desktop experience yeah. like they're they're definitely focusing more on mobile which also makes me wonder if their resources that go into gaming and things like that will also start shifting more to mobile we're seeing that DirectX and uh, the whatever it is the the whatever the pipeline is that's on Windows that is making gaming not as efficient as it is on Linux i would wager that gap is only going to in- continue yeah. to increase as Windows continues to be more and more mobilized 
and their developer base continues because once Microsoft goes in that direction, Microsoft yep. developers will go in that direction too. So it's going to be both the company and the developers moving in that direction mm -hmm. towards mobile gaming, less focus on desktop gaming. Yep. Meanwhile, Linux, we're at, we're at you know we're at ground zero in the elevator, and we've already got better performance than what's on Linux, and we're not even getting competitive yet. That's right. So I think potentially long term, if Linux keeps on its trajectory of continuing to be more and more efficient and mm -hmm. continuing to work better and better on the desktop, right. and Windows continues to focus less and less on the desktop, we might have a combination of vendors, hardware-wise, like NVIDIA and ATI mm -hmm. and Intel, who are creating fantastic drivers for Linux, combined with game developers who are, who are beginning to port That's over right. to Linux, combined with the incumbents in this space sort of pulling away, like exactly. Microsoft. Exactly. So it could be like these events all coalesce around the same time. That would help. But it's just going to take a while. It's going to take a while. Another thing they need to do is you want to really start this momentum a little less of this on youtube videos and a little more of a parody commercial yeah um, you know the the windows they experience the oh hey look i've just updated my computer my game no longer runs play into the play into the shortcomings of the other platforms and say hey look we're offering an experience that's going to work regardless because we're working very closely with this other company versus working with microsoft you know just really try and hit on those strengths and something that's entertaining to watch don't bore us to tears with these stand up on stage yappity yap. You know, I I don't. Most people don't want to watch that, especially mm. casual folks. Now, hardcore, yeah. you know, folks. Yeah, okay, we're into that. But you know, one you of the know, one of the speaking of, well, speaking <laughs> of YouTube and gamers, on one of the reasons uh, we did the Let's Play giveaways uh, was because. Yeah. I think it helps encourage Linux gaming just to see other people out there playing Linux games. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, anything you can do to get some engagement going. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. even just demos. Yeah. Um, you know, this is what it looks like under Linux. It's just like, it's like a grassroots way to say... This is gaming. It's here. We're yeah. proud, and it's awesome. Watch me play this game. Or it doesn't even have to do be anything a split great. Pepsi challenge, to where you've got a split screen. You're running the same game, right? Yeah. And it's like cost comparison beneath it. Here's how much it costs for my, you know, for my Windows 8 upgrade along with my game. Here's like, you know, things like that, where people are thinking, oh, hey, you know, all I do on this computer is game anyway. Why don't I just do this? You know, well, wouldn't that like be that. interesting? Is if people yeah. start treating their PCs more and more like a console, and exactly. then, then maybe the OS, sort of like how cloud computing apps make desktop apps That's less right. relevant. Exactly. Basically, mm -hmm. it's a it's a gaming console that happens to have a browser and an email client. I mean, a lot of people are running their systems like that. Cater to it. Try it. Why not? So, uh, one correction I want to make at the top of the show: mm -hmm. I mentioned that uh, the Oculus Rift SDK runs on Linux. Mm -hmm. the screenshot I saw wasn't the SDK running on Linux; that was the controller running on Linux. Oh, so okay. The SDK does not yet yet run on Not Linux yet. for the Oculus Rift. Now, I will worry about that more when I actually can get my hands on an Oculus Rift. Right. And the fact that I can still, though, what I'm happy about, hook up the Oculus Rift to a Linux box. That's cool. Happy about that. Yes. So they were doing that OpenGL 3D browsing powered by a Linux box. Love that. It's pretty that. crazy. I'd love to do that on that the show. That would be cool. Imagine LASS you know, in we virtual could reality. Jerry rig like a laptop up against our head because it would look about the same, right? You know, just walking Yeah, I guess so. Actually, maybe I could just hold, maybe if you if you just held the laptop and I'll just stare at it and you just move it. What you, duct tape. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Powered by a Raspberry Pi. It's kind of like right? those glass things you're always seeing, right? You know, where people got like their phones taped, duct taped to their head. So uh, I think we're going to have some more experiments coming up with the Raspberry Pi. Probably. I just got, uh, I got a couple of different uh, SD cards that Q5Sys included with one of them. And uh, I think the timing's right. You know, replacing cloud services with uh, Raspberry Pi-based solutions could be an interesting experiment. So if you have any suggestions for things you'd like to see us do with the Raspberry Pi, yeah. email those in to linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Now, I mentioned that uh, pretty soon we're going to be working on um, improving our email Right. I was actually thinking about outsourcing some of the mail uh, well, parsing to the community. I don't know. What do you think? If we uh, had like, a yeah. of, if we had like a deputy who was like our some email trusted, deputy, some trusted, uh, and, yeah, some trusted folks. That's something I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. So they would say they would kind of, they would be sort of the the communication, the last communications department. Communications and they would officer. Us on yeah. the really important things. I don't know. I might not yeah. work. It's just we get a lot of emails sometimes, and we lose some of the good ones. I think it would be possible. Yeah. I think, yeah, it'd be interesting. Uh, but to try. until we get that. Totally dialed in. One of the best ways to get our attention is to go over to the subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Start a thread over there. We usually almost always see it. And uh, then also the community can kind of help weight it so it goes towards the top. And you so can do the it. Raspberry Pi suggestions there as well. That'd be uh, awesome. That'd and be... maybe the SD card fixes for yes, ours. please. That'd be good, yeah, that'd too. That'd be cool. Matt, what are you up to this week? As always, you can find me at datamation.com. Scroll down to open source. And I'm usually writing about one thing or the other, uh, such as uh, purchasing uh, laptops for Ubuntu, for nice. example. Very nice, Matt. Very mm -hmm. nice. We also got links to both our social 
social profiles in the yep. show notes. I want to give a special plug to uh, this week's episode of Unfilter. Mm, yes. We did a uh, teardown of what's going on with NSA PRISM, mm -hmm. uh, how it works technically, how they're able to get away legally saying yeah. that uh, they're not watching Americans traffic when they are. Yeah. That little technicality that they work on. And a few other really, uh, really interesting things. Really happy with the latest episode of Unfilter. So if you've been following or haven't been following the NSA stuff, go check that episode out. A lot of good info in there. Definitely. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Join us live on Sundays over at jblive.tv. Then download us a little bit later. All right. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> oh, you're such a ham. You're such a hamstick. You're a hamstick. No, you. No, you are. No, you are. You. What is this? Said, Hello to the show. Dylan, what day is it today? Uh, Sunday. And what is Sunday? Uh, Father's Day. That's right. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>